today, the renaissance that we're experiencing in art, science, and technology is over 500 years in the making. I'd stretch it to millennia. And it aims to do one thing, which is to integrate all of human knowledge through collaborations that lead to endless innovations in all fields. Innovations that can help improve the state of the world and also create a sustainable future. To me, that's a future that actually we can work together to sustain at any level. <clears throat> and innovations that are coming out, creating whole new fields of knowledge like nanotechnology and nanoscience. You've probably heard about these. They cross all different fields. They're integrating knowledge in every way. They're working at scales that are unimaginable, smallest things, atom by atom, and creating all kinds of new structures that will be useful for engineering and kind of um, maximizing everything from fuel cells to batteries to bioengineering to the way we treat cancers. What I'd like to talk about is about the fundamental process that underlies this art science. And it was summed up, I think, very beautifully by uh, a science fiction author, Isaac Asimov. And he said, there is an art to science and a science in art, and the two are not enemies. Rather, they're different aspects of the whole. And we need the whole to look at the big picture of nature, to understand how nature connects everything. And we need the whole, using our whole brains, every aspect of what we've learned and grow. We need all of that in order to transcend our compartmentalized ways of thinking about the world. And that tends to hinder our development, tends to hinder the, the connections and relationships we make because we listen very differently to each other. So the essence of this is going to be a, a focused on that understanding. So those slides you see here is... One of the best inventors and innovators we know, Da Vinci, he was one of those quintessential art scientists who literally embodied and envisioned and built his innovations inspired by nature. And I use him, we all do, we go back to in innovators like this, that in fact, never mind that he looked and anticipated things like the helicopter and hydraulic constructs that he used for waterways and grist mills and so forth. What he really taught us so valuable that we need to leverage and build on is literally how to open our minds. How to, that's the first thing. And how to challenge our curiosity. And also how to expand our imaginations, not our egos, our imaginations. And how to be creative as critical thinkers. But most importantly, how to heighten our awareness of the world around us and ourselves. And he did that in drawings and paintings and everything. And he's one of many. And I just told that example, there are thousands of Da Vinci likes that are out there in every field that are tying information together and growing beyond it. So those are not simply good habits of mind. Those are actually skills and things that we need to actually do what art science is about, which is about connecting, again, integrating information from all fields. Why? To improve the human communication piece because that, in turn, makes more effective collaborations where people can begin to understand each other and know that when they take information from one field and another, it's okay to, to understand that it's going to be messy, that it's going to be parts of it are going to be confusing, and it doesn't have to be brilliantly clear. You can muddle and grope like Einstein did. So pulling from all these different areas and understanding we have the World Wide Web and those kinds of inventions now to actually leverage that. Look what's going on there. If you think about art science and you want details of where is this stuff all, it's in everything, it's ubiquitous. Because in fact, if you look at all the technology that we've designed, including something as sophisticated as that, we're creating and sharing new knowledge at light speed now, intuitively, and that's our future. So how we build and grow from that. Well, I want to introduce you, the, the one idea, the one process and practice that I come back to always is something I call art science, but it has many different names. It's like, it's like Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a, a Thousand Faces and, and so forth, is that in fact, when people are going through a set of, of these steps of connecting, discovering, inventing, and applying knowledge over and over again. Metaforming is simply a word of seeing everything in the world 
as a metaphor, as, as a story, a symbol, a hypothesis, as something that you can use in the most fluid way, that everything is metaphorical and symbolic. And you can use it in any way to transform the information ideas you have in a personally meaningful and productive way and purposeful way. That's what this process is. And it builds on, it's derived from one of the greatest generalizations. That is the scientific method, the generalization about the creative inquiry. The scientific method, which we use in many different ways to create new knowledge and then confirm it or not. And we all see examples of that when you're watching CSI, right? Crime scenes investigators and you're testing things and you're experimenting constantly, look at things. But in essence, that process is something I want to emphasize here. And I want to just simply reference a couple pieces and stop and walk you right back. The bigger picture for me, starting with my own work, I would make these art installations, and I'll show you five of them very quickly. That 130-foot piece with 515 images called Thought Assemblies was trying to look at the nature of creativity, how similarly, as human beings, we create and innovate and discover and communicate. Not differences, but actually looking for the similarities. And so do you need roller skates to kind of go through that and get up and close and back and forth and see it. But that sprawling piece, as large as it is, is tiny because it's looking at structures and events happening about the creative process itself that are meant to say, when you look at it and say, gee, I kind of think like that, or I put ideas together like that. And that's another installation view of that thought assemblies piece. The second one is called the Brain Theater of Mental Imagery. And I had to invent new technology that MIT patented for me to make those giant monoprints that are about, that one is about 100 feet high, but the piece is trying to look at and delve into other hidden dimensions of the creative process, namely our more destructive potential. I was trying to figure out why is it that we're so good at, at tapping our destructivity and, and terrible sometimes at our, our realizing and, and, and trying to draw out our creativity. And so this piece, this giant monotype that is representing sort of abstract images of the human mind and you see examples on there with layers of paint and objects and holograms on there are looking at a pattern that we have done for for millions of years namely what we imagine we build what we build we use you know it's it's a statement and that applies to whether it's poetry or it's advanced weapons and this is kind of looking at what is the biological roots of our that tendency that that ability to manifest these things and here is a hologram that is actually it's a slice of the human brain and it's got this very hostile figure that's popping out leaping out from this area of the brain like the heart of the brain and sleeping on its side is a Buddha. You can see a very calm image on, on that temporal side in the bottom of that image. And then another that's restrained. But you have these dynamics going on. And so I use these mind icons to raise questions, these brain-shaped mind icons to raise questions about our creative potential. This other installation is called Radical Futures. It's called the Neurosphere. And it's 200 feet long. It envelops you as you walk around in it. And I had built and made these structures in there shortly after the first Gulf War and started that over in Israel. And those structures, you look there that looked like steel rods kind of in the corners, those are representing the essence of the human presence. If you removed age and race and gender and all that stuff and you looked at the essence of what our humanity is and I asked three fundamental questions from those who experienced this exhibition. The first question was, what do we want our civilizations to become? The second is, what vision do we have of our education systems? And the third is, what would we like our sense of humanity or ethics or values to be? What are those things? And those little beats you see along the tops are measured of seconds or milliseconds, and really you immersed yourself and you kind of walked around there. Well, ten day, literally a day, before this show opened in February 26, 1993, 
there was a huge blast that ripped through 10 blocks away from the World Trade Center. That's where the gallery at the Ronald Feldman was. And it was like, it was a pre-9-11 call. It was like you could hear Bob Dylan saying, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. You could just feel what was going on there. And this was a reflection about those experiences I had in building and making these objects that were meant as a contemplation center, as a place to ponder these fundamental questions, to raise these questions about where our sense of humanity are going. <clears throat> this fourth installation was called Changing Minds, and it was inspired by a statement that H.G. Wells said in 1919. He said, you know, the future is a race between education and catastrophe. And what he was envisioning at that time, he was coming from Victorian age and the period of compartmentalizing knowledge and thinking very, very, in a very divide, differentiate, compartmentalized, specialized kind of mode. And <clears throat> this exhibition was a reflection of how we can constructively work differently and learn to learn at an accelerated rate, which is what we are all faced with now. And that jumble of wood that you see there, that actually looks like a beaver's lodge. It's about 4,000 pounds of, of raw lumber. And inside it was this cube that you could go in there. It was like going inside the eye of a hurricane. And you felt very, very, very calm in there. So instead of running from chaos, it, the invitation was to embrace it, to experience it, to understand the complexities and chaos that we are experiencing today, all the unpredictabilities that are going on today, how we cope with it, how we manage it, that is our world. So those disconnected, disassociated elements, that's what those wood pieces were. And as you looked at the mind icons, those brain-shaped icons throughout the whole gallery in that space, each of them were raising fundamental questions about what we were evolving towards, what we wanted to envision for ourselves. And there was a brilliant piece that Ornette Coleman and his harmelodics group was performing uh, to, to this particular exhibition that gave it a whole nother depth and meaning. This last installation was called Split Second. And in that, I raised one question only. In the face of our precarious future, as the human race brazenly dares to be the most endangered species, given all the technology we've invented to look out and scope out our place in the universe and destiny and so forth, so much that we have that we're wagering on when you talk about risk and reward. It asks how, in fact, how we will have the agility and the wisdom to actually resist and maybe dodge nature's demonstratively negative forces that can absolutely obliterate us if we make dumb decisions, irrational decisions, so forth. So that reflection was about that piece. And you'll see those pieces out there. All these artworks in there were asking these kinds of questions. They're brain-based because, in fact, the science of my studies in neuroscience are actually embedded in the art. If you go around, you'll see pieces of it, even the titles of them. That's called Love Thalamus, and it's looking at a particular area of the brain that, in fact, our emotions and logic and so forth are infused. And so just, um, just to make a point, to move from the fine art, what for me was the journey is taking this process of looking at art and understanding that art is really encompasses all representations of thought. Everything that we have generated in terms of symbolic languages, everything that you can imagine. As I say, in art, anything goes because imagination goes with everything. And you can take and repurpose everything in personally meaningful ways. And that is principally what these individuals are doing when they're giving form to their thoughts and feelings and ideas by making symbolic models and not necessarily making art as we would say with all the judgments and value judgments to it. It's putting all that aside and looking to the essence and saying, how can I show you what I'm thinking and feeling and allowing that to speak for itself, to be present and to see? and to enable it to be, as you see in that statement there, to create and vision in the most free-form way without the judgment and value judgments to it. So that process we have used in so many areas and ways, literally from A to Z. 
Here are people who have come together. They're educators, they're science people, they're people from the administration. This was at the Smithsonian through, it's called the Art of Science Learning, where they're actually looking for how we can apply the arts to help and enable the science, technology, engineering, math, all these different fields that are trying to build a 21st century workforce. So the point of it is that you can use any materials in any way you ever envisioned, not necessarily with the end goal to make a work of art. And in doing that process, in experiencing the kinds of communications that happen at a very deep level, all kinds of breakthroughs naturally happen. And what I have found when I challenge, and I challenge you with this, because in fact, the whole risks and rewards of doing something is when you take a concept, an idea that you want to explore with somebody, instead of simply talking to them, make a structure and talk through that structure. Doesn't matter what it looks like, the aesthetic of it, but try to represent as best you can what your thoughts, feelings, ideas are, and invite others into that conversation because you will find that as you're doing that, and then as you go through that four-step process in here, you are, in fact, as you're metaforming, you are thinking like a genius. You are absolutely connecting your world, your experiences, your metaphors with others and are able, no matter how personal they are, to actually envision things and then create what you envision. And to have that connection at a profoundly personal and universal level. And those tools in that process, again, think back to the generalization of science and the scientific method, is, is so purposeful and useful. Um, we have done this program and that Think Like a Genius program that grew out of the art science program is ongoing. There's a foundation around that. And the reality is when you're metaforming, you're metaforming everything all the time, endlessly. So that is what I challenge and task you on. And it's something that you have in your own creative engine there to use and build on. So enjoy. <laughs>